Hi, uh, my name is Risa Hoffman. I'm a physician in the Division of Infectious Diseases and uh, UCLA Program in Global Health, and I'm here today to talk to you about health and safety uh, as part of uh, pre-travel curriculum. Uh, if you're listening to this lecture, you should be a clinical student or a trainee uh, planning to do uh, an elective internationally. Uh, if you're a preclinical student, uh, please see a separate topic um, listed by uh, non-clinical or preclinical in the curriculum. So the list of uh, topics we're going to cover today include uh, HIV exposures and post-exposure prophylaxis, food and water safety, additional health and safety pearls for travel, and I'm going to touch base at the end about UCLA travel insurance, how to sign up, and uh, what services are provided to you as part of traveling abroad as a UCLA uh, student or trainee. So we're going to start talking a little bit about occupational exposures because many of you traveling abroad to work clinically will be working in areas of extremely high HIV prevalence. About 4.4 million healthcare workers sustain greater than 800,000 sharp injuries annually, and an estimated 16,000 of these are from HIV-infected patients. Um, a survey has suggested that 74% of physicians and nurses have a needle stick exposure at some point in their careers, and most of these go unreported. And rates are similar for trainees, um, along with these high rates of poor reporting. And one thing I'm going to emphasize over the next few slides is how important it's going to be for you as a trainee abroad to uh, make sure that you are well uh, versed on this topic and that you do report and get help if you, are, uh, if you do sustain an exposure while working abroad. Uh, this slide is just a pie chart from Massachusetts from 2002 to 2004 showing you the types of people that are reporting needle stick exposures and you'll see that nurses and doctors are the most common. Uh, from UCLA Westwood campus in 2009, out of 260 people, uh, almost 20% were medical house staff. So these exposures are, uh, are relatively common, and again, it's important that this information be conveyed and that uh, you know it both for your practice here in Los Angeles as well as for any work you're doing abroad. So quick true-false question. Dengue can be transmitted by needle stick splash exposure. Take a second to think about it. True or false? The answer is true. Um, so while this topic is focused on HIV as uh, occupational exposure, uh, I want to emphasize that universal precautions are critical because there is a long list of things that can be transmitted through stick and splash exposures. So uh, as you're working, you should be aware of uh, the importance of barrier precautions and uh, you know careful that you are protecting yourself from all of these potential risks. So uh, this slide is showing you uh, the transmission model for HIV and SIV, which is the simian uh, version of HIV. And what I meant to convey in this slide is just that uh, HIV infection, once uh, an exposure occurs, really happens over a number of hours with a small founder population, maybe even a single virion causing infection. So we're going to come back to this a few times to state that it is the critical first hours of an exposure where an intervention should be done. It's much later in the course of infection that HIV is expanding and disseminating. So what are the factors that affect the risk of transmission, and is there a role for HIV viral load? So the answer is that we don't really know if the source person's viral load is, uh, you know, how to use that data for risk of transmission, but it's likely a surrogate of the risk. And the other flip side of this is that a low or undetectable viral load in the source person does not rule out the possibility of transmission. The other important note is that for many of you working in high HIV prevalence areas in very poor countries, viral load is not done as a routine test because it's too costly or the technology is not available or both, and so you won't likely have this information uh, to guide you. So this is just, again, emphasizing that blood pathogen transmission to healthcare workers uh, is a spectrum of risk by uh, type of infection, and that HIV is actually relatively difficult uh, to transmit relative to hepatitis B and hepatitis C. Um, all of you as UCLA uh, students and trainees will have been uh, vaccinated for hepatitis B and, and have been asked to provide evidence of that as you entered the system here at UCLA. 
um, again, for hepatitis C, we don't have any good post-exposure prophylaxis, so uh, precautions and uh, careful attention to work with patients is important to prevent this. Um, and you'll see the numbers for HIV percutaneous and mucocutaneous exposures are actually quite low, 0.3% and 0.09%. So what about the use of HIV post-exposure pro prophylaxis or PEP and what is the data for use in that for prevention of HIV transmission among healthcare workers? The only study that we have is a case control study uh, from a long time ago, 1997, where uh, 710 healthcare workers with an HIV exposure were evaluated. 31 of them acquired HIV and 679 did not. Uh, and the conclusion from the study is that the odds of HIV infection were drastically reduced by 81% in those people who received two drug post-exposure prophylaxis. That's two antiretroviral medications. Um, you'll see a relatively wide confidence interval here, but a, a very um, strong uh, efficacy for an intervention. Um, many problems with these types of studies, including the fact that they're looking back, they're retrospective. There was no unified protocol for this group of patients. They're very small numbers. Um, but nonetheless, this is the data that we have, and it is uh, something that means that there will never be a placebo controlled trial of PEP um, and that we know that this works and this works quite well. So knowing that PEP is an effective intervention if you have an exposure, um, when should you start PEP? Well, um, the risks of the medications are fairly constant over time, while the benefits are really most recognized the earlier that you take it after the time of exposure um, and go down the later you go before you start. And that goes back to the diagram I showed you of uh, the small founder population establishing infection within hours. So the answer is that PEP is started as soon as possible from the time of a real exposure. Um, just a little bit on uh, the animal data for duration of treatment. This is something, again, that we know very little about, um, but most of our data comes from animals. Um, this is 24 macaques who were inoculated with SHIV, which is, the again, the, the simian form. They received tenofovir uh, 24 hours after they were inoculated and had the drug administered for 3, 10, or 28 days. And you can see in this uh, depiction here that there were no seroconversions in the group that got 28 days of PEP, arguing strongly for a 28-day course being uh, most effective. Uh, simil a similar model um, where, again, they gave uh, the same drug but started it 48 hours before, 4 hours after, or 24 hours after exposure and had a control group that, a tr control group that was untreated and then treated all the macaques for 28 days showed no treated animals were infected and all the controls were infected. So um, the first point is PEP is effective and the second point is that um, it should be given for 28 days. So essentially, um, for occupational exposures uh, where HIV is an issue, um, the story is over and post-exposure prophylaxis is a critical intervention that we recommend. And I'm going to talk more about what exactly that means. But before we get into that, I wanted to also touch base on non-occupational post-exposure prophylaxis um, and what the data is on that and why I'm mentioning that. Well, um, non-occupational post-exposure prophylaxis means taking HIV medications after an exposure for an event that happens through uh, consensual or not consensual uh, sexual or intravenous drug use uh, exposure. And so for those of you traveling abroad, there's both uh, you know, a risk of uh, sexual assault as well as uh, the idea that potentially you could meet a partner and have a relationship abroad. So I want to make the very important point that uh, there is a high rate of HIV in many places and that sexual exposures are high risk. Um, there is no controlled data on the efficacy of non-occupational PEP. Uh, the mechanism of transmission differs. Um, obviously, uh, we're talking about the immunology of the genital tract, which is um, different in relation to viral loads, resistance patterns, and uh, levels of inflammation. With sexual exposures, repeated exposures are more common, and in cases of assault, uh, often the, the source person cannot be tested. 
So this is just a statement from the United States Public Health Service uh, CDC in 2005 that says the provision of antiretroviral drugs to prevent HIV infection after unanticipated sexual or injection drug use exposure might be beneficial for persons seeking care less than 72 hours after a non-occupational exposure. Um, a 28-day course of antiretroviral therapy is recommended and should be initiated as soon as possible. So this is becoming common practice in the real world, um, and the safety and feasibility of this has been demonstrated mostly in men who have sex with men and is being studied here in LA County um, by colleagues here at UCLA. Um, so again, just another slide saying that many organizations do endorse this practice. Um, and again, something just to kind of show you the different risks of HIV acquisition after different types of exposures, showing you that um, certain types of sexual activity is actually slightly higher risk than a percutaneous needle stick exposure, um, and that the risk from s sexual exposures is, you know, um, significant. Um, so, you know, encouraging you to be safe and think wisely as you are working and traveling abroad. So getting into the practical steps following an HIV exposure, um, and for those of you also um, able to access the website right now, there is a, a partner HIV exposure emergency card, which you should keep available on uh, a, a phone device or print and keep with you um, so that you have these easily available in case you need them. So step one, the first step for skin exposures, you want to wash with soap and water. For small wounds and punctures, you can clean with an antiseptic, such as an alcohol-based hand hygiene agent, although in many places these types of things are not available. For mucosal surface exposures, including eyes, you want to flush with copium, copious amounts of water um, or saline if available for the eyes, although again, these sorts of things may not be available in a lot of resource-poor settings. Step two is if, uh, if there's any concern about the exposure, um, if it is a real exposure, rather than waiting to get advice from somebody that may not be reached right away, um, we do recommend that you initiate the post-exposure prophylaxis immediately and no later than 48 to 72 hours. Um, the regimen you see below of Kaletra, two tablets uh, twice two tablets in the morning, two tablets in the evening, Truvada, one tablet once a day, is a regimen that's commonly recommended. This isn't the only regimen, um, and so it, this will largely depend on where you seek your pre-travel medical care and advice, um, but I do recommend for those of you who are doing rotations in high prevalence HIV areas that you travel with your own supply of post-exposure prophylaxis um, because these are medications that may not be uh, easily available to you in certain settings. Uh, these drugs are taken for a total of 28 days unless you are advised by somebody that the exposure was low enough risk to discontinue. Um, and they may be taken with or without food. Um, just going back to the same concept before of the importance of starting immediately because the virus does establish infection within hours of an exposure. Um, and again, just kind of reviewing that, we'll skip over it quickly. Um, step three is to call and discuss this with somebody. I think this is important both for your um, sort of emotional support as well as to make the right clinical decision. So all of you traveling ab abroad should have a UCLA faculty mentor or someone who has helped you to set up your rotation or your experience. Um, and you also should have local uh, mentors and faculty who are supporting you. Um, these are all people that, that could be involved and could help. Um, the questions that you want to ask are um, to describe the nature of the exposure. Is post-exposure prophylaxis necessary? Um, if it's possible to get a baseline uh, set of tests for you, and uh, also is it possible to test the source patient if their status is not known? Um, I just want to emphasize that um, from our standpoint as uh, faculty, um, really we, we want to know about these exposures. We want to support you and we want to help you make good decisions. So um, we will say that we, we really would like to have phone calls to help, help navigate these situations. Again, the definition of exposures um, are included on the back of the emergency card that you can print and take with you, but you shouldn't just rely on, on reading materials and, um, you know, you do have support back at UCLA to help guide you through these situations. Um, just a reminder, many of you know, but um, 
in particular for students who may not be as familiar, um, the home page of UCLA has a paging button. Um, you can also call via phone, um, the number listed here, and uh, you want to reach whoever you can, whether this be your UCLA faculty mentor supporting you. Um, I am available by pager as well. Um, for any questions or concerns or if the faculty mentor doesn't feel uh, that they can provide information. Um, and there's always uh, infectious disease faculty on call at both Reagan and Santa Monica. So if you uh, fail to reach your own faculty member and I'm uh, for some reason unavailable, um, the ID faculty on call would be another way to uh, get information about what to do after an exposure. Uh, possible side effects of the medications that um, I've recommended here, um, and again, this will vary based on where you seek your care. Um, for Kaletra, which is a protease inhibitor, also known as lopinavir ritonavir, side effects include mild diarrhea, nausea, and elevated triglycerides, even with short-term use. Um, however, we wouldn't have this dissuade us from uh, prescribing this medication for this indication. Truvada is a combination of two medications, nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors, emtricitabine and sinofovir. Um, and these are very well tolerated drugs. They can cause some nausea, headache, and uh, renal toxicity. So again, um, taking these medications does require some lab monitoring for safety. Again, the risks of these side effects far outweigh the benefits um, in the setting of a real uh, exposure. So just a reminder to be safe in the clinic and hospital, use univer universal precautions. Don't do procedures without supervision. Don't do procedures if you are uncomfortable and don't be afraid to ask for help. And also another reminder to be safe outside of the hospital and clinic for these you know, potential non-occupational exposures. Don't go out alone at night. Um, if you are going out, you know, try to be in pairs or groups, take taxis, arrange drivers. This is gonna vary by setting. There's clearly a spectrum of risk in different places in the world. Um, but this is something that always should be on your mind, even here in Los Angeles. And then be extremely cautious with dating because HIV and STI prevalence, this sexually transmitted infection prevalence is extremely high in many of the settings that you are uh, traveling and working in. So we're gonna skip to the second topic, which is uh, food and water safety while living and working abroad. This is, uh, from, uh, this is a typical meal from Malawi where I spend much of my time. Um, and this is a staple of the food in Africa, corn-based uh, uh, dish called Sima, and I think that one of the great pleasures of working abroad is experiencing new cultures um, and, and new food, um, and so I want to just uh, give you some pointers about how to avoid uh, spending much of your time being sick from your uh, from your explore, explorations of culture and food. So uh, a question for you to answer to yourself, what is traveler's diarrhea? Which of these is correct? A, most commonly caused by parasites. B, most commonly caused by viruses such as rotavirus. C, most commonly caused by bacteria such as E. coli. D, most commonly caused by differences in the composition of water and food in settings outside of the United States. Um, so the answer to this, hopefully you answered correctly, is C, traveler's diarrhea is most commonly caused by bacteria such as E. coli. So 40 to 60% of travelers uh, to uh, resource poor settings will experience an episode of diarrhea and it's nearly always benign and self-limited, um, although always concerning to the person who's having the experience. Um, and most of this is caused by bacteria and the most common cause, as we said, is the uh, enterotoxigenic E. coli or ETEC. This is a long list of things that might cause traveler's diarrhea and um, you know you can take a look at that and the risks are of these vary by region and by um, you know the types of activities that you might be doing but again um, most of this is going to be uh, just simple E. coli. The most common clinical presentation is the occurrence of diarrhea between 4 and 14 days after arrival. These episodes are usually self-limited and last 1 to 5 days. 20% um, of these can be severe enough to put you in bed for a couple of days. Um, and there can be a lot of associated symptoms with the most common cause, which is this E. coli, ETEC, um, including malaise, anorexia, some abdominal cramping, and then watery diarrhea may be associated with nausea, vomiting, and low-grade fever. For the management of traveler's diarrhea, there's uh, three 
possible things that you can do that will help, and I'm gonna go through each one. They are fluids or oral rehydration therapy, anti-motility agents, and antibiotics. So fluids are the uh, most important part of any episode of traveler's diarrhea, no matter how minor, and uh, the oral rehydration salts are really the, the safest and best way to address any, uh, any degree of traveler's diarrhea just to keep yourself feeling well and preventing uh, things from getting worse. Um, utilizing the sodium glucose co-transport, which you've all come to know and love in medical school, um, these are uh, a combination of uh, different uh, electrolytes uh, with glucose and sodium, and these are available um, to you basically in, in pre-packaged uh, form. So what I recommend for people is um, while you can make your own if you're abroad and you need it, um, the easiest thing is to go to REI or Adventure 16 and just pick up a couple packets and travel with them. Um, this will prevent you from having to, you know, search around for different ingredients um, while you're abroad, although these are definitely very commonly sold all over uh, countries where diarrhea is common. So um, what about anti-motility agents? Um, are they safe to use and when do you use them? So this is somewhat of a, a difficult question, um, but the bottom line is they can be effective with traveler's diarrhea, but must be used with caution. So the, the common anti-motility agents are Imodium or Lamotil, um, and they do reduce stools, but they don't treat the underlying cause of diarrhea. Um, they should absolutely not be used in any case of bloody diarrhea because they can um, in, uh, increase, they'll stop the motility and increase the severity of infection of certain more invasive pathogens. They are definitely safest to use in conjunction with antibiotics because of the possible concern that they could make um, an infection worse if it's one of the different uh, enteroinvasive organisms. Um, however, I think it is reasonable to use uh, an antidiarrheal for a very mild episode of diarrhea um, as a trial um, to see if it helps. I would quickly recommend that if things are not mild and if there is any doubt that it's best to use these in conjunction with antibiotics. And I list Cipro here um, as the most common one that's given for travelers abroad. Um, again, so what about antibiotics? Um, Cipro is most commonly prescribed, 500 BID. Um, azithromycin is a fine alternative and that may be prescribed by your uh, pre-travel uh, doctor. This is definitely recommended for moderate to severe diarrhea, and this definition here is for unformed stools, um, and you know may include uh, blood or pus or mucus in the stool, and may be associated with fever. Um, I think that you know obviously there's a, a range of of severity, and that you'll have to make a judgment call for yourself. Um, but again, I would say I would have a lower threshold to take an antibiotic for moderate to severe diarrhea. Uh, a single day of antibiotics actually may be adequate. Um, while the traditional teaching was always three days, what, um, what further uh, evaluation has shown is that many people will improve after just one day's worth of antibiotics and that the antibiotic can be discontinued at that time. Uh, and that's a you know, very adequate course. So um, basically the bottom line is one to three days of antibiotics depending on how fast the improvement occurs. Um, and again, I think for many of you who are going to places for a very short period of time um, and may only have three or four weeks to experience a, a setting that if you know, you're having uh, an episode of traveler's diarrhea that's preventing you from working or traveling, that it's reasonable to uh, treat it this way um, just to allow you to be able to sort of function in the activities that you need to do. Um, just a note for those of you going to as, uh, Asia, azithromycin is the recommended treatment over ciprofloxacin um, for specific concerns due to campylobacter resistance. Uh, so prevention of traveler's diarrhea, many of you know this and it's somewhat common sense, but I think it's important to emphasize that you want to avoid tap water uh, and make sure that uh, when you're drinking bottled water that the seal on the bottled water is not broken. Um, ice in drinks is definitely not safe unless you know that it's made from adequately boiled or filtered water. Um, 
and many times you can ask but you also have to have a sense of whether you would trust the facility to be doing this properly um, an important note that alcohol does not sterilize water or ice and so mixed drinks uh, may still be contaminated um, and there's a pearl here that if you can't get bottled water, you can boil um, your water or get specialized water filters. I imagine many of you are going to places where this wouldn't be necessary, um, but it's, you know, if you think you may be in a place where you wouldn't get bottled water, you can, um, you can buy water filters from different uh, places like REI or use this boiling technique. Other uh, ways to prevent traveler's diarrhea, there's higher risk foods. Um, uh, avoiding raw meat um, unless you're willing to trust the restaurant, uh, avoiding uh, uh, smoked or pickled meats because these techniques don't often uh, kill parasites. Raw vegetables and fruits may be contaminated so you have to again be certain that they're either uh, washed well or avoid them entirely. Um, it is safe to eat anything that can be peeled uh, such as a banana, um, and you want to avoid salads unless you know that things have been adequately uh, cleaned by uh, safe water. Other uh, types of things to consider are certain types of fish are um, may contain toxins that aren't killed by cooking. Um, they're listed there. Um, I think this is an uncommon risk, but um, I just mention it for your uh, knowledge. Um, a bigger risk, however, is uh, the street vendor, which I think is something that is very tempting in many places. Um, there are high rates of contamination from these types of places, and so uh, just to beware of, of that particular risk. The other important thing that can occur is that um, food on an airline comes from the city of departure. So if you're traveling, uh, you know, for example, on the African continent and you're flying from Malawi to South Africa, the food uh, on that flight from Malawi will be coming from Malawi. Um, and so you want to use the same sorts of precautions that you would be using while you were there in that country. So when to seek help, I think the answer is, you know, have a low threshold to seek help. Um, you're obviously going to be working in medical settings and hopefully we'll have uh, faculty and mentors who are going to be well experienced in these types of things and can advise you. Um, and certainly uh, UCLA faculty back home who you should reach out to with any concerns. Um, definitely any illness that lasts, fevers beyond 10 to 14 days, high fever, abdominal pain, bloody diarrhea, or severe vomiting um, are, you know, warning signs that should seek medical attention immediately. Um, generally, we reserve stool cultures um, and o ova and parasites for cases that last more than two weeks. So now I'm going to touch on the third uh, bullet in the outline, which is just some additional travel pearls for health and safety. Um, the first is uh, the issue of prescription and over-the-counter medicines. So when I'm traveling abroad, when I'm getting ready to go on a trip, the first thing I do is open my medicine cabinet and take a look at what's in there. And then I think about what I use on a regular basis and I pull it out to pack it. Um, so the bottom line is you should be bringing your own medications, whether they're over-the-counter or prescription, because you can't necessarily get these same medications in other countries. Um, Many drugs that require a prescription in the U.S. can be bought over the counter through a chemist in other countries, but um, you don't always know that the strength or uh, quality of these preparations is the same. Um, so it's much better just to, again, come prepared with uh, the things that you use and need on a daily basis or an intermittent basis. Um, for contact lenses, um, you know, if, if you wear them, it's good to bring your own uh, sterile saline solution uh, with you. Um, depending on where you're traveling and where you're working, I think this um, is something you could think about, which is to go to, again, REI or Adventure 16 and buy a small first aid kit. The nice thing about this is it does often come with um, a lot of things that you don't have to then think about remembering the Band-Aids and the, um, the, you know, the Tylenol and the Motrin, that it all comes together in a kit like this. Um, also, depending on where you're traveling, you can consider bringing sterile needles, and these can be bought from the same places I just mentioned. Um, but if you do bring sterile needles, just be sure that you don't uh, bring them on your carry-on because they'll be taken away at the airport. Swimming and water safety. Um, in many areas of the world, it is not safe to swim in fresh water, um, and I think you have to both rely on local people to guide you, but also 
come in with your own information and having done your research um, because you will find there is controversy on what people say locally and what is reported in the literature or in uh, you know travel health health guides um, as a rule the more stagnant the water the more likely it is to be unsafe um, chlorinated pool water is generally safe um, and salt water is generally safe unless it's in an area that could be contaminated by sewage and that's something that generally you can assess by just looking at the environment. This is a picture of Lake Malawi, which is one of the most beautiful places in the world um, and very tempting uh, to swim in this lake here. Um, but there are scattered areas around Lake Malawi that have a parasite called schistosomiasis. And it's very hard to know in a certain area whether this parasite is present or not present. So again, just an example of uh, making sure you do your homework beforehand, know what your risks are, and then uh, you know make safe decisions as you're uh, working and traveling. This is just an example. Schistosomiasis is one of the risks of fresh water. Um, you can see that most of it is, uh, is, is, most of the risk is in Africa, um, although there is some risk in uh, South America and Asia. So the next topic is animal and insect bites. Um, this is an important one for those of you um, going almost anywhere in the world because uh, this isn't really uh, limited to just a specific place like Africa. So animal bites are an important risk when you're traveling in, in many settings. Um, there's many countries have uh, street dogs, village dogs, pack dogs, um, and these are you know not necessarily friendly dogs um, and rabies is very very common in developing countries and is most commonly transmitted by dog bites. Um, so as a rule, you know, you may recognize common signs of rabies in an animal and avoid it, but you really can't always tell if an animal is rabid by looking at it. And no matter how much you love animals and may be tempted, um, I would say that um, the safest is just to avoid animals, especially um, when they're not domesticated um, out in the streets and village areas. If you did uh, have an animal bite, uh, any any type of bite, uh, you want to wash the wound with soap and water for 10 to 15 minutes and seek medical attention. Um, you may need to receive rabies post-exposure prophylaxis. Post-exposure rabies immunization is required regardless of a history of vaccination, so some people may have gotten pre-exposure vaccination, but this does not mean you don't need also to have the post-exposure immunization. Um, and unlike the United States where we often catch the animal and observe it or test it, um, in these countries those sorts of programs typically don't exist, so it's better just to let it go and seek medical attention. Uh, insect and tick bites are important for risks of malaria, dengue, yellow fever, filariasis, tick bite fever. There's a very long list. Um, and this isn't just a dusk to dawn risk that people typically think of for malaria, that there are day biting mosquitoes that also transmit infectious diseases. Um, where appropriate, and again, this is something that you're going to have to do site specific research on, um, sleep with bed nets. They should be tucked in and they should have no holes. Um, these can also be cheaply purchased in most places, so if you are staying somewhere with a bed net that isn't uh, in good shape, you can buy one very cheaply. Um, and also malaria prophylaxis where appropriate, and this is something that should be discussed by your pre-travel uh, physician visit. Um, to prevent insect bites, the most important thing is, well, the twofold approach. One is insect repellent, and the second is covering up. So in terms of repellent, you want to apply it sparingly um, only to the exposed skin. D concentrations between 30 and 35 percent are typically effective, and you want to avoid applying high concentrations to the skin because they don't increase the efficacy and can increase the irritation that you experience. And most forms of DEET don't come with uh, sunscreen combined, so you want to remember that just because you've put DEET on doesn't mean that you may not need sunscreen as well. Um, there are certain non-DEET repellents and with citronella or other natural ingredients, and they are generally not as long-acting and not as effective as DEET. 
Um, permethrin is a, something that can be sprayed on clothes or bed nets, or, or you can soak uh, things in permethrin, and it's potent for up to six weeks, even with washing. So depending on where you're going, how rural, how exposed, um, this would be something to com consider. Um, places like REI and Adventure 16 also frequently sell uh, impregnated uh, shirts and clothing that you can purchase um, that are effective. And then, you know, this is something that usually is provided or can be purchased at a particular location where you're staying, but flying insect spray um, with a uh, pyrethroid insecticide can be used. Um, in terms of if you're out and about in, in a place that has a high risk for uh, insect bites, you know, you d generally want to cover up even though it's, it's uh, hot and that may be uncomfortable. Um, you want to have long pants, long sleeves, and you know be covered up in important areas, and imp avoiding bright colors, perfumes, shiny things, scented soaps, because these actually attract insects. In case of a febrile illness, again, you do want to seek medical attention. Um, I think in in these cases, your local um, hosts and local mentors uh, would be people that you. Uh, could get advice from and again contacting your UCLA faculty mentor always um, is a, a good idea. Um, in many places it's very easy to get uh, courses of malaria treatment that are uh, based, they're uh, ar uh, artemether based um, or if you're traveling with a drug like malarone you can take your own treatment course which is four tabs daily for three days. Um, so you can always choose the self-treatment option if you're unable to be evaluated, if you're traveling on safari and you can't get to a doctor, um, but it is important to, to seek help if you do become ill. This is just a picture of the type of malaria treatment available in Malawi. Um, they come in packets. They're very clearly uh, de uh, described for patients, and you can usually purchase this type of a thing at your uh, country site as well and just keep it with you in case uh, there's a need. So for additional health and safety information, I'm listing here sites that you should uh, explore, including the CDC um, and the State Department. For supplies, I've mentioned <coughs> a few times REI and Adventure 16. Uh, these are great places to get ideas and, uh, and find uh, some of the things I've mentioned throughout the talk. So our last topic, the fourth bullet point, is uh, UCLA travel insurance. This is a critical thing for you to do before you leave is register and sign up. Uh, so the first thing to do is register your trip online using UC Trips and you'll see the link right there. You can uh, type that into your browser. Um, you create a, a personal uh, profile using this system. So um, who is covered? Basically everyone that travels on any type of UCLA activity or UCLA business. Um, Coverage includes emergency medical evacuation, out-of-country medical expenses if you need to be treated overseas, um, security extraction if there were to be a political instability, sorry, uh, political instability um, or a reason that you needed to be expatriated. Um, there's also travel assistance services if you lose your passport. Um, there's coverage for loss of personal effects and customized travel intelligence, which is basically an email system that tells you uh, what's going on in the countries where you're traveling um, in the months prior to travel, um, it, starting from the time you register. So in order to register, when you go to the website, you'll see this link. You put your name, your email, your UC ID number. Um, most of you will be graduate students in training as your category. Um, and you are the Los Angeles campus. You'll then be um, entering your travel destinations and you'll have a chance to put in every destination even if it's a stopover and you want to list that along with those dates. At the bottom of this screen there'll be a submit button. You'll push that button and you'll um, be able to complete your registration. Um, you, you'll click on whether you're a student or employee um, and you'll be sent an email that looks something like this um, with what is, if printed and cut, is a card that would fit in your wallet. Um, you can also program these phone numbers into your phone, which I do recommend if you're going to travel with a phone, um, because if you're in need, um, you want to have this readily available. So I would say keep it on your email, 
uh, put the phone numbers and the policy information into your phone and then put a card in your wallet or your travel folder um, and you know have this information handy so I've covered a lot of topics and a lot of information um, and I think one of the most important points is that whenever in doubt call for help um, as you're planning your your uh, program abroad be thinking about who your local support is who your UCLA support is um, and as mentioned um, I'm available uh, for questions or for help or for calls regarding any uh, occupational exposures um, so I'll leave you with my email at the top of the page, rhoffman at mednet.ucla.edu. Um, and uh, thank you for listening. And I believe uh, we'll be following up. Uh, you'll be required to submit some uh, evidence of completion of this lecture. Um, and that information should be available on the website curriculum page for this. So have fun uh, and safe travels.